Hello, everyone. Just arriving. We'll start at five after. Hi, Vina. Hi, Jason. Hello, Vasilye. We're just waiting a few more minutes. Well, actually, more like another minute. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so did you guys manage to get through that first chapter? That's what we're discussing today. Just chapter one. It's a short book, but uh, there's a lot packed into even a sentence. <laughs> you may have noticed that there are often very ornate, complicated sentences that are very rich. Uh, you can get a lot out of them. Um, hopefully it wasn't too dense to get through. Uh, of course, you know, if you need to, you should certainly use the help of a Serbian version of the book. Um, another thing about this book is, and I mentioned this uh, last time, is that it contains a lot of cultural references um, that you may or may not have heard of and we will bring those up as they arrive in the discussion um, because they do add a little bit of, uh, well, they provide some insight for sure and they add flavor and sometimes they're just, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're something darker, um, but it's very interesting. Yeah, Pinchon seems to have a penchant for making cultural references high and low. Uh, so yeah, he plays with lowbrow culture, like The Simpsons, as we mentioned, as well as highbrow culture. Um, and it's a very rich field for, uh, I don't know, <laughs> it would be a mixed metaphor, a rich field for mining. <laughs> No, a rich field for reaping uh, meaning. There's so much that you can get out of thinking about just like names and the way that things are phrased. Um, okay, well, let me go ahead and just one sec here.
fire up the old presentation. Okay. So, chapter one, Crying of Lot 49. Um, Anybody have any initial comments? Did you guys have an okay time getting through this? I guess so. Yeah, okay. Good, good, good. Can you explain uh, us uh, what does mean crying of lot? What, what is, uh, how to translate? What is the meaning, symbolic meaning? What is the, how to... Well, we'll get to symbolic meaning, but from what I know, because this is also my first time reading this book, um, but I have, I have uh, read about what the title refers to, and it's, um, so, do you know uh, what an estate auction is? An estate auction is when uh, someone's estate, like someone has passed on, and they have you know, properties and, you know, belongings that go up for auction. Um, and the items in the auction are referred to by lot number, right? And apparently the crying of lot 49 is the calling out of the 49th lot in the estate sale that we're going to be discussing here briefly because right from the beginning of the book, we get that information that, um, uh, well, first the characters. Um, the characters in this story, we meet our main character, character Eddie Pamas, uh, who's a bored suburban housewife. Um, we meet her husband, Wendell Moss, Mucho Moss, much more. Um, <laughs> Pierce and Verarity. Uh, he is the deceased real estate mogul uh, that she finds she'll be executing the estate for. Her therapist, Dr. Hilarious, uh, and their lawyer, Roseman, who's only referred to as Roseman, as far as I can tell. I haven't found a place where his first name is mentioned. I may have missed it if somebody finds it and let me know. Um, so you have a lot to think about with the names and um, I've been thinking about the names and also, well, we'll get more on that later. I don't wanna to go too much down that path just yet. We will talk about the names for sure. Um, you can hardly help but talk about names like these. <laughs> um, so yeah, right from the first line of the book, we get you know, one of these really rich sentences that provides a lot of it's seemingly almost jumbled information. Um, so it takes a bit of analysis to kind of pull it apart. Uh, it, you know, if I had a student give me a, an essay with this sentence, I might tell them to make it a bit clearer, but it's part of the style. Um, so yeah, one summer afternoon, Miss Edipa Moss came home from a Tupperware party. Who knows what that is? That's, we're going to talk about that for a second. I do, I do, I yeah. do. <laughs> Can you tell us about a Tupperware it's, party? It's plastic. Yes, it's, it's a plasticware sale where the salesman or sales girl, doesn't matter, comes to, to a certain house. And then the hostess hosts this sale of the Tupperware, of, of the plasticware. Mm -hmm. And then the host gets uh, a present, something. And this is the, the Tupperware party where this happens. Where right. The guests uh, have arrived to, to buy those uh, plastic plasticware. <laughs> right. That's right. Am I right? That's right. Did you live in the U.S.? Well. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty, Let's I mean. Let's say so. Okay. Because that's a. Uh... <laughs> Not a lot of people know what a Tupperware party is. They don't, I don't know if they still have those. It's very uh, 1960s, 1950s. I mean, I guess I remember when I was really little uh, people talking about having Tupperware parties. Um, Tupperware is the name of a company that makes uh, plasticware that's meant to keep food fresh, you know, little sealing 
plastic boxes and plastic pitchers and plastic things that seal up so that you can store things safely. That's what Tupperware is. Um, and yeah, these parties were part of the, the way that this company marketed itself, um, at least if I understand correctly, the, the host was selling in order to get a kind of commission from the company for all the stuff that they sold. So they would uh, make it a little party. It's basically a sales pitch uh, and you know, probably with some alcohol to, <laughs> to get people more in the mood to buy something. Not necessarily with alcohol, of course, all kinds of people had all kinds of parties. Apparently at this Tupperware party, there was alcohol served. <laughs> she had come home from a Tupperware party whose hostess had perhaps put too much kirsch in the fondue. Again, such very specific things. Kirsch is a kind of brandy or kind of a liqueur uh, made from cherries. Fondue, fondue is amazing actually. Um, fondue is a kind of uh, style of dining in which uh, there are pots that are heated actively at the table, like with a fire underneath them. And uh, they have different things in them. So you'll have a fondue pot with cheese and uh, you'll have a fondue pot with chocolate. You'll have a fondue pot with perhaps hot oil and you use it to cook the things right there at the table, right? Or cover them in chocolate or whatever you fancy. Um, you would put alcohol in the fondue pot because of the, the cheese mixtures. In order to make a cheese suspension for fondue, you have to use alcohol. Otherwise the cheese will clot and not be usable. Anyway, <laughs> there's a lot to explain just in the first couple of clauses here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, too much Kirsch in the fondue to find that she, Edipa, had been named executor, or she supposed executrix, uh, of the estate of one Pierce N. Verarity, a California real estate mogul who had once lost $2 million in his spare time. See how we're like going down a different path now, uh, but still had assets numerous and tangled enough to make the job of sorting it all out more than honorary. So... To put it quite simply, she comes home from a party and finds a letter that tells her she's going to be executing someone's will. If you guys know what that means, basically she's managing his estates because she was named the executor by him. So he has passed on, he's died. Um, and these last clauses exist to let us know that this is no small task that she's being asked to do, right? This guy has a lot of money, uh, had once lost $2 million in his spare time. And this is in the 60s. That was a lot of money back then. <laughs> uh, still a lot of money now, but it was a lot more then. OK. Um, <laughs> she stands in the living room, stared at by the greenish dead eye of the TV tube. Uh, she spoke the name of God, tried to feel as drunk as possible, but this did not work. So right away, there's something going on here with the uh, invocation of the, the name of God, as well as stared at by the greenish dead eye of the TV tube. And this is something that's going to, we're going to be discussing things in this theme as we go through the story, <clears throat> because in the end, this is going to be her uh, search for meaning in the living room right now she gets the meaningless right she gets the dead eye of the television that has nothing to say meaningful to her um uh so yeah this is a theme that we'll be repeating Anybody have anything they want to add to this? Uh, I, I'm not putting the entire chapter word for word for you guys who haven't been in one of my groups before. I'm not going through everything word for word. Um, it just, it's not practical. <laughs> it, wouldn't it wouldn't work for time purposes. But if there is something in particular that you want to discuss, please let me know and we'll uh, throw it up on the screen or we can discuss it just uh, without doing so. Um, she thinks back about Pierce. So Pierce, it turns out, I should have added an extra bit of information. Uh, Pierce is an ex-lover of hers. She's now married to this uh, DJ that we're going to meet in a second. Um, 
Yeah, Pierce is her ex, ex-lover. She wonders why he would name her executor of his estates. It doesn't make any sense to her. She thinks back and she associates different memories with Pierce. She remembers uh, a Mazatlan hotel room. Uh, it actually says the slamming of the door of the hotel room. This is a good little device because I think it tells us that their separation was perhaps uh, not amicable or maybe it was kind of abrupt or not peaceful. Uh, she remembers a library slope at Cornell University. It says one that nobody uh, could see because of the way that it was facing. And a bust of Jay Gould, whom I have placed, of whom I've placed a picture here. Jay Gould. Uh, so this is kind of interesting to maybe let us know something about Pierce, who is, after all, a real estate guy. Um, Gould was, he was a rival of J.P. Morgan. You guys know what the robber barons were in the Gilded Age. These are uh, people who had become immensely wealthy uh, before there were any kind of protective labor laws, and they were considered very unscrupulous and brutal profiteers on uh, humans, <laughs> people. Um, there's a lot of history there. I mean, the, the sort of things that these guys became known for were not good, aside from you know being rich, which say what you will about that, but the way that they became rich, <laughs> uh, considered, let's say, just very uh, ruthless uh, opportunism and uh, kind of brutal pursuit of profit. So the fact that Pierce had this bust, like this statue of Jay Gould on his shelf, tells us maybe something about Pierce and his uh, people he admires. Um, we also get a piece of the picture because um, Oedipus says that she used to fear that that bust would fall on them while they were sleeping. So then you realize that oh, they were together. Um, it doesn't really get stated explicitly yet. Um, and she wonders if that's how perhaps he died, you know, smashed <laughs> in the head by the bust of Jay Gould. And she thinks that's kind of amusing. Um, so yeah, she finds herself in possession of a great task. Um, She thinks back to, to try to figure out why he made this decision. So she thinks back to a year ago because it says that he died in the spring and she was named the executor one year ago. So she's like, what happened a year ago? Um, as she's going somewhere, it took her till the middle of Huntley and Brinkley. So those are streets, right? She's going somewhere to remember that last year at three or so in the morning, there are a couple of calls at three in the morning coming up in the story here. Uh, there had come this long distance call from where she would never know unless now he'd left a diary by a voice beginning in heavy Slavic tones as a second secretary of the Transylvanian consulate looking for an escaped bat. Now, are you guys confused or about what's happening here it, it might seem a bit odd so here's the deal uh pierce he's a big joker he's calling and he's doing all these voices that's what's happening he's uh being funny and he's a guy who does a lot of voices which i must admit i'm a guy who does a lot of voices normally i just don't do them during the book club very much <laughs> i find it makes them a bit sympathetic he does these impressions, right? He's joking around. He calls up and he says, "Ah, uh, hello, this is the, uh, what was it? Second secre secretary at the Transylvanian consulate. <laughs> We're looking for an escaped bat, right? He's, he's just doing voices, that's it. 
then he modulates into comic Negro. So he, imita he imitates, I guess, uh, African-American vernacular English, um, as they say, Ave. Uh, then the hostile Pachuco dialect. So Pachuco is like, uh, like Mexican gangster, young sort of Mexican or Hispanic gangster. Doesn't have to be Mexican, I suppose. Full of chingas and maricones. Then he imitates a Gestapo officer, asking her in shrieks, did she have any relatives in Germany? And finally, his Lamont Cranston voice. Lamont Cranston is a character that we're going to talk about in a second. Um, the one he talked all the way, uh, the one he talked in all the way down to uh, Mazatlan. So on their trip to Mazatlan, apparently they were there together. He talked in that voice the whole time. <laughs> And uh, so she says, Pierce, please, I thought we had, but Margot earnestly, I've just come from Commissioner Weston. And that old man in the funhouse was murdered by the same blowgun that killed Professor Quackenbush. <clears throat> so he's just continuing the joke. <clears throat> the important thing here is that uh, we see he's a joker and Lamont Cranston, let's talk about that because that's what this last part is about. There used to be a radio show in the 1930s, I think, maybe even earlier, uh, called The Shadow. And the theme of The Shadow was that The Shadow was a character who could see the evil in men's hearts. <laughs> uh, it began that The Shadow was the narr just the narrator. And so he was able to tell you, like any omniscient narrator what was happening in people's heads but they started making the narrator into this character the shadow and uh you might ask like how how do i know this well the shadow has actually been through many iterations over the years and even had or like everything had a reboot it had a movie made in like the 1990s um with uh who was it actually i can't remember um <clears throat> So yeah, he's kind of a superhero, but not a superhero, really. His only power is that he's able to kind of be sort of invisible and see what people do uh, and see the evil that they, that they do and the evil that motivates them. And the whole, uh, let's say, tagline or slogan, I guess, for the shadow was, the shadow knows. And... Uh, Lamont Cranston was the alter ego, kind of the Clark Kent of Superman. You know how the superheroes, they all have this like civilian clothing version of themselves. Uh, Lamont Cranston was that for the shadow. And yeah, this last part is him trying to play out a, a bit of the one of the shadow plays um, where there's been some sort of murder and he makes up the silly Quackenbush name or either he makes up a silly name Quackenbush or uh, the or something tells us that it's not really remembered what he said. Um, so that's the thing. Pierce calls and he's being just funny. Um, uh, Bucho, by the way, they're, it's three o'clock in the morning. They're both asleep. They're married now. Mucho and Edipa, and this call comes at three in the morning, and Mucho is like, just hang up on him because he's being silly, <laughs> and it's three in the morning. And uh, Pierce on the phone says, "I heard that," and then he goes on to say, uh, "I think it's time Wendell had a little visit from the shadow." <laughs> Silence, positive and thorough, fell. So it was the last of his voices she ever heard. Um, I haven't finished with the book yet, but I'm wondering if this is going to be important. The last voice she ever heard was the last voice of, of his uh, funny imitation voices. Actually, the last voice she ever heard from him at all was the voice of Lamont Cranston, the character from the Shadow series. Um, so. I hope that brought a little bit of clarity to what's happening there, because I suppose uh, when you first read it, you might be just like, what the heck is going on? Is he just changing into different people? No, it's, it's simpler than you think. 
he's a joker, that's all. So there's that. Um, so yeah, we meet Mucho. Mucho is a very strange character and it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I think that uh, we learn more about Mucho than anyone else in this chapter, don't we? <laughs> because we hear a lot about his past job and his current job and his very strange uh, fixations and anxieties that are tied up with his job and his past job. Um, so yeah, I mean, we don't find out too much about Oedipa yet, you know, except for you know, a little bit about her past um, and the fact that she's, well, we will find out in this first chapter that she feels like she's on the margins of her own story, but we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so yeah, he, he's a DJ. I was confused when I first read that. The DJ uh, who worked further along the peninsula and suffered regular crises of conscience about his profession. I, I, I still have, I'm kind of confused about like, what are, what are the crises of conscience that he's having? What terrible thing is he doing to, to make him feel guilty about being a, a DJ? So first of all, this wouldn't be a sort of party DJ. You know, this would be a 19... 50s or 60s radio DJ, right? Uh, someone who performs on the radio. Um, working further down the peninsula is a reference to a part of California. It doesn't matter. It's more of a, I mean, maybe it does. <laughs> I don't have much to add to, the, to it though, unless you guys have something. But yeah, he's, he's a DJ. He's a radio DJ who uh, he can't believe in any of what he's doing. Now, I'm thinking about that. And I wonder, but actually, let me hear. Do you guys have any idea why he might have crises of conscience about being a disc jockey, about being a DJ on the radio? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, right, it sounds like a pretty good job. <laughs> it's probably more fun than a lot of jobs. And the only thing I can think of right now is... I mean, we'll, we'll try to come up with some more stuff later, but it, maybe it's just the uh, um, sort of commercialization of art or something that bothers him because it's, uh, I don't know, do you guys understand what I'm getting at there? You know, this, uh, yes, Vasilia, you raised a hand. I think uh, he isn't fulfilled with uh, himself. That's true. I, I think you're right about that. Um, the crisis of conscience, though. In other words, he feels guilty about something. To have a crisis of conscience means that you feel that you're doing something wrong. Now, it could be just that he feels like he's doing something wrong in the sense that he's not, he's sinning against himself, you know, not fulfilling his real potentials and desires. That could be the crisis of conscience. Or it could be, like I said, the commercialization of art, which is uh, a thing that, that could be the issue. I don't know. It's very funny. Actually, he, he's, well, I guess it bears mentioning that we go on to find out that he's an excessively sensitive person. So it could be just really nothing, nothing important. He could just be sort of neurotic um, somehow. Um, we find out that before he was a disc jockey, he worked at a car dealership. Oh, yeah. He has a problem with viscous substances. <laughs> so let's clarify what that means. He has a problem with uh, thick liquids, like honey, for example. So again, he seems to have just some sort of neurotic issues. Um, yeah, though he dieted, he could still not, as Oedipa did, Oedipa did, use honey to sweeten his coffee. He could not use honey, right? Problem. Uh, for like all things viscous, it distressed him. <laughs> it distressed him to see viscous fluids. So yeah, he has issues for sure. Um, 
recalling too poignantly what is often mixed with motor oil to ooze dishonest into the gaps between the piston and the cylinder wall. So um, I was looking around at what things are mixed with motor oil. <laughs> and I couldn't find anything that would make him feel so nervous. Um, there are all kinds of things that get mixed with motor oil. <clears throat> things that, first of all, you guys know what vis viscous means. It's, I think it's the same, or actually in word, the word in Serbian I think is like gustocha. For like oil, like motor oil has viscosity rating and that's the thickness of the oil, right? If you, any of you who have operated a vehicle enough or maybe maybe not, uh, <laughs> would know that the, that's uh, the thing you've got to get the right thickness of the oil depending on the climate and other issues about the engine. Mm. Um, so yeah, apparently something is mixed with motor oil to ooze dishonest into gaps between piston and cylinder wall. That's of course where the oil in the engine would go. Um, any questions about that? He's just talking about the functioning of the engine. He walked out of a party one night because somebody used the word cream puff. The word cream puff annoyed him. <laughs> it made him feel nervous and unhappy. It seemed maliciously. <laughs> this, is, this is actually pretty funny. I, I find it. It made me laugh when I first uh, read it. The idea that someone would say the word cream puff maliciously. <laughs> With malice, in other words, with intention to hurt someone else. <laughs> Just imagining what that looks like is funny. Um, the man was a uh, refugee Hungarian pastry cook. <laughs> talking shop, meaning talking about work. Uh, so the guy was just talking about his day at the bakery. Mucho is very, a very nervous character. He's someone who <laughs> marches out of a party saying, that man said cream puff to hurt my feelings. Um, but there was your Mucho, thin skinned. So yes, there you have it. He's, he's a nervous person. Okay. You guys have anything to add to that? Uh, we're just meeting people. Not much actually happens in this first uh, story or in this first chapter. You know, we just uh, she gets the the letter. She makes a couple visits to people and recalls some things, and we meet characters. Um, yeah, he used to be a a used car dealer. That's important too, uh, because he has a very negative sort of memories of cleaning out the used cars that people brought to trade in for other used cars. Mm. And there's quite a bit of elaborate description. I didn't list it all here um, of, you know, finding things. And he's someone who really overthinks, right? Because as he goes through the, the trash, the detritus cleaned out of the cars that people brought in, he wonders, which of the things are actual uh, trash that were that was thrown away, and which things are just forgotten items? So this is someone who thinks about that. <laughs> so he thinks he's, he thinks a lot. He overanalyzes. He sees the trash coming out of the car, and he starts categorizing it mentally. I wonder which of these things, what which of these items are forgotten items? I wonder which of these things are refused. He calls them refused. Um, which makes sense if you think about the noun refuse, which means garbage like trash. Um, yeah, he says, all the bits and pieces coated uniformly like a salad of despair in a gray dressing of ash, condensed exhaust, dust, body wastes. It made him sick to look, but he had to look. Um, he finds the whole thing depressing and terrible. Um, but at least he believed in the cars, it says. <laughs> um, so can, Edipa, you explain, can you explain us uh, this salad of despair? What is how to translate this? What is um, the, what? Uh, well, 
it's it's really just a metaphor um, that he's looking at the pile of objects <clears throat> from people's used cars, right? People bring in their used car to trade for another used car. And there's a pile of stuff that comes out of each car, unless they keep it clean, I suppose. Um, and by salad here, he's just saying a mixture of things. Um, the despair is really in him, isn't it, though? <laughs> I mean, there's nothing inherently despairing about the loose change. And uh, he says, you know, torn out yellow pages. Those are, uh, yeah, yellow pages are here, too, now, like the phone directory. Um, lists and you know scraps of cloth and, and things that were taken out of the car he sees it as a salad of despair all of that mixture of of stuff that, that came out of the used car forgotten and thrown away it's just a, a metaphor okay uh as mucho comes home and he, he immediately starts talking about how bad a day he had at the at the radio station. He has a weekly confrontation with his boss because he's not <laughs> the boss doesn't like the way he talks to the young female callers into the show. Then Oedipa uh, says that she might well she implies that she would perhaps like some help in executing the will. Mm. Oh no, says Mucho, you got the wrong fella, not me. I can't even make out our income tax right. Execute a will, there's nothing I can tell you. See Roseman, their lawyer. So he refuses to help. Um, before she manages to get to see the lawyer, her therapist calls in the middle of the night, again at like three in the morning, uh, just as Pierce did. We're going to explore these parallels as we go forward, but it's fair to say that the author might be drawing a parallel between uh, the therapist and, and Pierce. Um, he says, I didn't wake you up, did I? You sound so frightened. How are the pills not working? It doesn't say exactly why she goes to therapy, but I, I think it's fair to presume that he's giving her like tranquilizers for anxiety or something like that. I'm not taking them, she said. You feel threatened by them? But remember, it's three in the morning, by the way. <laughs> it's, a lot of scenes in this book make you wonder whether they're really happening or not. Isn't that the case? Was that the case for you guys? I mean, just having a no normal conversation at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <clears throat> You feel threatened by the pills, he asked. I don't know what's inside them. I don't, uh, you don't believe they're only tranquilizers? He asked. Do I trust you? She didn't. And what she said, what he said next explained why not. We still need a hundred and fourth for the bridge. Okay, so it goes on to say that the bridge is a drug experiment that his laboratory is doing. They're looking for volunteers. They're looking for housewives to give hallucinogens to. Um, they, he's saying they need a 104th participant for the bridge. The bridge is the name of the experiment group. So this is a guy who's trying to get her to join into some kind of uh, drug experiment. <laughs> um, and that's why she doesn't trust him with the pills that he gives her. Um, she refuses. She says, you have plenty of people to choose from. You don't need me. Um, she does, uh, he does say, yes, we have millions to choose from, but we want you. Um, hanging in the air over her bed, she now beheld the well-known portrait of Uncle, so Uncle Sam, this is the portrait in question, <clears throat> that appears in front of all our post offices, his eyes gleaming unhealthily, his sunken yellow cheeks most violently rouged, made red his finger pointing between her eyes. I want you. She had never asked Dr. Hilarious why. Why, why do you want me in particular? 
because she was afraid what he might say. She tells him, I'm having a hallucination right now. I don't need drugs for that. <laughs> I'm seeing Uncle Sam over the bed, <laughs> pointing at me. Uh, Uncle Sam is apparently Dr. Hilarious, right? I mean, he's the one who's saying, I want you for this experiment. Um, so she uh, refuses to go into the experiment, but we hear about some of Hilarious's theories. Um, uh, his theory that a face is symmetrical like a Rorschach blot. If you guys, you guys know what that is, that's the ink blot test that uh, apparently is still used where the psychiatrist shows a symmetrical blot of ink and, they, and asks, what do you see in the ink blot? And someone says, a butterfly or my father or something like that, or both. Um, so yeah, he has the theory that a face is symmetrical like a Rorschach blot, tells a story like a TAT picture. So that's, uh, that's a kind of picture that requires uh, a patient to explain what happened before the picture. So it's a picture of like some people doing something and uh, the doctor asks, so can you explain to me what happened leading up to this scene? It's called something like thematic apperception, something like that. That's the TA part. I can't remember the final T. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a kind of picture that requires the patient to explain what's going on in the picture. Uh, he also says the face excites a response like a suggested word. So why not? He claimed uh, to have once cured a case of hysterical blindness, which is apparently a kind of a psychosomatic blindness condition um, with his number 37. He calls it the Fu Manchu. <clears throat> Many of the faces having like German symphonies, both a number and a nickname. So he calls number 37 the Fu Manchu. What is the Fu Manchu? Well, that's where he makes the sort of offensive character oriental face at the patient, slanting his eyes up with the index fingers, <laughs> enlarging the nostrils with the middle fingers, pulling the mouth wide with the pinkies and the protruding tongue. He makes a silly face called, that he calls the Fu Manchu at the patient and the patient is apparently cured. So. This is ridiculous. <laughs> it's completely absurd. Um, is he really a doctor? <laughs> Seems a valid question. Uh, next, we meet Roseman, another character fraught with oddities, uh, just full of oddities. Um, more cultural references here. Roseman has been up all night brooding over Perry Mason. So Perry Mason was so popular, also a 1950s television show. It was so popular that it was still in syndication when I was growing up, uh, like in the 80s. <laughs> yes, I'm older than I look. Um, yeah, Perry Mason has been around for a very long time. Uh, in fact, they just remade, actually they made a series last year um, that's the prequel to Perry Mason. It's before he was a lawyer. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, it's okay if you guys are into sort of like uh, detective noir mystery shows. That's the kind of thing that the, the prequel series is. But the original series, Perry Mason was, I think it was the first courtroom drama television show, right? Perry Mason's a lawyer, he's, uh, he always wins the case, of course. Well, I think there are a couple of exceptions where he lost, but it turns out, you know, some there was some special reason for it. He was cheated or something like that. Um, yeah, Perry Mason was the first uh, really popular courtroom television drama show. I think not even just the first popular one. It might be the first uh, show that was a courtroom drama. Uh, I have to check, but anyway. The lawyer, their, their family lawyer, the couple's lawyer, 
he's been watching Perry Mason all night, brooding over Perry Mason. So he's got a problem with Perry Mason. We go on to find out uh, his wife is very fond of of the show, but Roseman has a fierce ambivalence. Do you guys know what ambivalence is? Ambivalence. Okay. When somebody uh, ha has, uh, how to say, a uh, double character, the something is, uh, how to say. He has double feelings, more Double, like. yes. Uh, it's... He has both feelings. Ambi, ambi is like both or around, like ambiance or ambidexterity. That's where you can use either hand to do some task. Uh, Ambivalence means that uh, he feels two ways, or maybe more than two. So love, love, hate, as they say, <laughs> he has a love hate feeling about Perry Mason. He wants to be successful like Perry Mason, but that's impossible. I mean, Perry Mason is a fictional character who is whose success could rarely be matched in the real world. Uh, so he wants to destroy Perry Mason by undermining him. Again, he's a fictional character, so it's kind of funny that he wants to destroy Perry Mason. Um, one detail that I didn't put into the cards here was that uh, he's working on a book in which he, he goes against Perry Mason. It's called something, uh, The Case of Something, a not-so-theoretical, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the book now find it later. Basically, he's working on a book in which he undermines Carrie Mace, Perry Mason's uh, performance in a courtroom setting, apparently, something like that. Maybe he pulls apart one of Perry Mason's supposed famous cases. We don't know what's exactly in the book. We just know that he's toiled over it for many years. So Roseman is another strange character who's kind of obsessed with it. This is Perry Mason, by the way. I figured I would just throw a picture of Perry Mason in. <laughs> Um, uh, she surprises him on her arrival. He says, you might have been one of, per one of Perry Mason's spies. <laughs> um, after thinking for a moment, he adds, he adds, ha, 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 says Oedipa. Uh, it's funny because I read this a few different times, doing them in different styles of ha, ha. Is it really haha, -ha, or is it ha, ha, or, <laughs> or <laughs> is it sarcastic? Is it genuine? What is it? Uh, <laughs> you really laughing, or is he like, is he like uh, Nelson from The Simpsons? Ha ha. <laughs> A lot of Simpsons references going on in this group. Okay. Um, ah says ha ha says Edipa. They looked at each other. <laughs> <laughs> the scene goes on. I have to execute a will. She's, this is funny. I have to execute a will. She said, oh, go on then. Don't let me keep you. <laughs> she just got there and he's like, okay, sure, go. <laughs> Pretty funny. Uh, no, no. And she told him the whole story, told him all. Uh, why would he do a thing like that? Roseman puzzled. You mean die? <laughs> like that's what he would mean. Uh I thought it was a pretty funny little exchange of dialogue. That's why I picked it out. Um, he flirts with her. Run away with me, said Roseman when the coffee came. Where, she asked. That shut him up. <laughs> he says, he's got no plans. Where? And he's like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Actually, he doesn't even say that. He also plays footsie with her under the table, like kicking her feet. But it says that she's wearing boots, so she doesn't care. <laughs> she's just like, whatever. She ignores him because she's insulated by the boots. Um, so she receives her call to adventure. That's the thing here. Um, hey, she says, can't I get somebody to do it for me? Me, said Roseman. Some of it, sure, but aren't you even interested? In what? In what you might find out. Ah, so there it is, the call to adventure for the board housewife. She has the chance to break out of her, her world. Uh, it goes on to say some other interesting things. 
uh, as things developed, she was to have all manner of revelations. Mm, she would learn lots of secrets. Hardly about Pierce in verity. By the way, just think about that name because there's so many ways you can think about it. Uh, Ver vera, like truth, in verity. So maybe not truth or maybe in truth. <laughs> it could go all different ways. Um, anyway, uh, hardly about Pierce or herself, but about what remained yet had somehow before this stayed away. Mm -hmm. This is where she's starting to realize her own existence is kind of blurry. It says, uh, there had hung the sense of a buffering, insulation. So in other words, a kind of protective barrier around her, right? Mm. Insulating her from the real world. She had noticed the absence of an intensity. In other words, her life is kind of dull, as if watching a movie just perceptively out of focus. So she's watching a movie, but it's a little blurry. She's realizing that, that she would like to have some clarity. She would like to, she would like to answer the call really um, and have the, the picture be fixed. <laughs> um, I, I quoted a lot from the last few paragraphs here because there's a lot uh, that we can talk about. She had gently conned herself. Conned herself means she tricked herself. Uh, a con, do you guys know con artist? <laughs> a con artist is a person who tricks someone in order to steal from them. Uh, she had conned herself into the curious Rapunzel-like role of a pensive girl, a thoughtful girl somehow magically prisoner among the pines and salt fogs of Kinneret where she lives. Uh, so yeah, she realizes she's just kind of made herself a prisoner over time without ever really realizing it, just sort of imperceptibly tricked, like step by step, tricked herself into this position where she's trapped, uh, looking for someone to say, hey, let down your hair. When it turned out to be Pierce, she'd happily pulled out the pins and curlers and down it tumbled with its whispering dainty avalanche. Only when Pierce had got maybe halfway up. So Pierce is climbing her hair as a, you guys know, the, is it the same Rapunzel? I guess it's the same in Serbian, right? The, the, the fairy tale or the, um, yeah, he gets halfway up uh, and her lovely hair turned through some sinister sorcery into a great unanchored wig. <laughs> so her hair turns fake and down he fell on his ass. Uh, but Dauntless, perhaps using one of his many credit cards for a shim, in other words, to slip the, slip between the door and the door jam, he pulls out a credit card. This is funny because we're informed earlier that he's very wealthy. Uh, and he has this, you know, very crass uh, solution to the, to the, the myth, uh, that not the myth, but yeah, I guess that would be the mythology of the Rapunzel like tower. Oh, I'll just use a credit card <laughs> to open the door. Um, <laughs> this is very crude, right? Uh, he'd slip the lock on her tower and come up the conch-like stairs. The conch is a seashell, a big swirling seashell, uh, which had true guile, guile is cleverness, had true guile come more naturally to him, he'd have done to begin with. So. It's a crass but effective solution. And if he were a little bit more clever, he would have done that before he tried climbing her hair, which is really not a practical way of doing things. <laughs> um, uh, but all that had then gone on between them had never really escaped the confine confinement of that tower. So she realizes that her relationship with Pierce was her trying to get out of this figurative tower that she felt herself trapped in, but really he had just come into the tower, so they never escaped anywhere. Um, as we had have had allusions to, they made a trip to Mexico at some point, um, and she has a memory of wandering into an exhibition of paintings by the beautiful Spanish exile uh, Remedios Varo. Uh, remedios, I guess it would be. And she remembers perusing a particular painting. 
this is the painting that I showed you briefly last time, and I'm going to show you again in just a moment. Um, and it definitely has a Rapunzel sort of relatable theme to it. In the central painting of a triptych, a triptych is a three-part painting, if you guys didn't know. The painting was titled Bordando el Manto Terrestre. terrestre. Uh, where a number of frail girls with heart-shaped faces, huge eyes, spun gold hair, prisoners in the top room of a circular tower. Um, here's the painting. Embroidering a kind of tapestry which spilled out the slit windows and into a void, seeking hopelessly to fill the void. So they're spinning, uh, by the way, this uh, embroidery is spinning of a kind of cloth, if you were not sure what they meant here. Uh, for all the other buildings and creatures and the waves and the ships and the forest of the earth were contained in the tapestry and the tapestry was the world. So these trapped maidens are weaving the world itself from the top of their tower, but they're trapped, right? So, I mean, that this ties to the Rapunzel thing of being trapped in the tower, but they're creating the world. And it says, actually, I think I put more of this um, yeah, she had looked down at her feet and known then because of a painting. So the painting causes her to have a revelation, causes her to realize something important about herself, uh, that what she stood on had only been woven together a couple of thousand miles away in her own tower. So she made, in other words, she has created her own world. She's created her own prison. Uh, was only by accident known as Mexico. In other words, it could have been anywhere. Uh, and so Pierce had taken her away from nothing, right? The trip to Mexico was, she was still in, in this prison that she has suddenly realized herself to be trapped inside of. Um, why did she, or what did she so desire escape from? Such a captive maiden, having plenty of time to think, soon realizes that her tower, its height and architecture, are like her ego, only incidental. In other words, uh, arbitrary. We, we talked a lot about, for you guys who weren't <laughs> uh, with us in the previous groups, arbitrariness is something that keeps coming up. Arbitrariness means uh, without something without reason, without uh, something random or, I mean, in, sense, in a sense, it can't be totally incidental, her cage. Uh, well, we'll get more into that as we go through. Uh, what really keeps her where she is, is magic. Anonymous and malignant. Visited on her from outside and for no reason at all. So, hmm, hmm. Visited on her for, from outside. So she perceives, and this is, uh, I mentioned before that paranoia is going to play into this, <laughs> into this story. She begins to perceive her situation as uh, not just of her own creation, but that there is a kind of anonymous malignant force out there acting on her, trapping her. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really kind of paranoiac way of thinking. I mean, well, we'll see. Uh, having no apparatus except gut fear and female cunning to exempt. By the way, at the time this was written, the phrase female cunning would have been less problematic. <laughs> uh, nowadays, it's natural to say, what's that supposed to mean? <laughs> um, uh, to examine this uh, formless magic, to understand how it works, uh, how to measure its field strength, count its lines of force. Uh, she may fall back on superstition. She, in other words, she might take a superstitious view as to how she has ended up where she is. Um, oh, no, no, that's not what it's saying. Sorry, 
let me start again. <laughs> this is how she might uh, pass her time. Actually, I guess I probably would like some input from you guys on this. Uh, yeah, she has no way of seeing the magic that's affecting her that she's just mentioned, this malignant force. Um, she has no way of judging it. Um, she's here now listing the kinds of things that she can do in her, in her cage, in her prison. She might fall back on superstition. She might take up a hobby like embroidery, or she might go mad or marry a DJ, which is what she did. <laughs> <laughs> These are the options that one has. <laughs> if the tower is everywhere, you know, like she said, she went to Mexico and she was still imprisoned. Uh, and the night of deliverance, in other words, her Prince Charming or whatever, if her night of deliverance is no proof against its magic, in other words, the night of deliverance can't do anything, <laughs> what else? And uh, that's... That's where we end this chapter because she's on the precipice. And uh, I thought of the tower, the, the tarot card. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not like some kind of mystic or anything, but um, it seemed, it, it is something. I, I have friends who, who are into that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it seemed appropriate because the card, it represents the time to like make a decision the tower is about to fall and you have the choice of staying in the tower and you have the cho choice of jumping out and uh, either way you risk uh, well you take great risk you risk some terrible thing happening um, but it's also the chance to be liberated and reborn uh, so it has that kind of dual meaning to it and i wonder if that was uh also kind of intended to be implied in this uh, use of the tower imagery um so yeah we don't find out about her decision yet we'll find out find out about that next time but i think it's fair to assume that she does answer the call mm. things to think about for next time what's with these names uh Think about the names. Think about how they might add to your interpretation of uh, what's happening in the story, including the names of uh, uh, even like the, the name Kinnereth, the place that she lives is something like, uh, oh, I can't remember now. <laughs> it's a, a biblical location. <clears throat> so there are lots of ways that you can uh, delve into this. Uh, yeah, characters, places, and other titles in the book. So there'll be titles of songs, for example, uh, you'll see in the next chapter that might offer some new ways of seeing what is happening in the text. Or they could be, you know, just an interesting diversion. Uh, they don't, you shouldn't feel restricted. In other words, you shouldn't say, oh, well, that's silly. That's not what the author meant. Because on some level, Maybe that's not really the point. Uh, in fact, many people believe that uh, Thomas Pynchon was more or less trolling people with a lot of these names <laughs> in order to, to make them wonder. Um, but in many cases, there's really nothing at all. Now, we don't know that that's true either. That's just the legend. And it's, uh, it's good to think of it that way. I think it's, it's better if it's unresolved, right? It's less exciting if we're going to come down and give a sort of authoritarian final meaning of the book and that each line that we could look at, like a little guide that says, this line means that, and that line means this. That would be incredibly boring. <laughs> it's much, much more exciting for us to, to look, even if there is nothing there that the author intended, it's still something that affected you and, you know, supplied you with some meaningful insight of some kind, or maybe it was just fun. Uh, so next week, discussion of chapter two. Um, do you guys have some things that you'd like to say here? I really wanna open it up to questions and discussion.
All right. Well, listen, if you have, uh, uh huh, go ahead. Okay. Well, I was going to say that this, um, okay, I haven't read this book for years and I mm -hmm. came in kind of late today and I apologize to everyone for that if I um, repeat myself, but I've really been looking forward to this and pretty uh -huh. excited. But I think that some of these things, okay, because first of all, everybody should know one thing. I'm like 60 years old. So, a lot of these cultural icons that people are looking back on are things that, you know, I, I saw on TV when I was, you know, small. But I think that his, um, and excuse me if this was said and I missed it at some point because I also had to do something else, but that some of what he's talking about with Edipa Mass and her, um, her feelings, it really brings me to mind of the talk going around at the time. And remember, I was really small just hearing it around the room of um, Betty Friedman's feminine mystique. Mm -hmm. Did anybody come across anything like that in this ideology of or what he's and I think the point of all the symbolism in the book also Jay mm -hmm. that you talk about and the fact that some of it may be right some of it may be trolling and I think it's a lot like you like you said it is he plays with words a lot and you're mm -hmm. bound to get multi faceted or faceted meanings out of this so I think this can mm -hmm. be a really good discussion if, Absolutely. I mean, did anybody else see any of those kind of things or notice any? I don't think there's a correct interpretation. Even if Pynchon yeah. says, I didn't mean that, we can look at him after all this writing he's done and say, could it be subconscious, Tom? Could it be coming right. out of your... <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I think even the stories about Pinchon saying that are also cryptic. Like <laughs> that's it. he didn't even necessarily say anything about it. It's just like people have been grasping for so long that they really want there to be something. And I mean, there's a similar thing with uh, James Joyce, uh, especially the book Finnegan's Wake. That book is wildly difficult to even understand what's happening on a given page because sometimes he just doesn't use any punctuation or just makes up random words that are part Yiddish, like part like meant to be read in an Irish accent. And uh, <laughs> the thing is like you, you can read one sentence three ways and people still to this day find new things in there. And there's always this question, did James Joyce mean to put that in there? And really at some point you kind of have to throw away that question, right? Like it doesn't really matter at some point after all this time and people still finding things, you know? It's a treasure hunt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So did anybody else see anything in this or, you know, I just wondered about the rest of the crew. <laughs> <laughs> we'll cross-reference more things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow your lead with that uh, the feminist mystique that's interesting that sounds really interesting i hadn't thought about it um yeah it sounds like fertile ground um and yeah again whatever you can pick up from the names and you're going to see some things that are pretty obviously references to one thing or another um and other things that are a bit more cryptic All right. Many names sound very peculiar to me. Yeah. Oh, that's for sure. I mean, these names are very atypical names, <laughs> no doubt. Mm. Except for perhaps Roseman. You know, that's a somewhat normal name. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, they're all. And I, I, I was tempted to start looking into uh, some supplementary material as soon as I started to, I was like, I shouldn't do this because there was too much. Uh, first of all, there's so much to get into. People have been writing about this book forever. Um, and uh, one of the things I first stumbled upon was that uh, for Pierce Inver, uh, what is it? Inver I forgot his name now. 
in very rare. <laughs> very rare. I don't want to find it again. Uh, it's very oddly. It's it's hard for me to remember just because of the way it's put. Uh, oh yeah, in verarity, in verarity. So uh, he 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 ends up being this uh, person who has well in that estate he has these stamps uh, that are going to be really valuable. And uh, somebody had found that uh, there's a term in philatel phil 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 philately yeah philately inverse rarity that like those. Uh, planes that are flipped over on those famous stamps that were misprinted. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I really want to go this far. And I'm like, I'm, I'm just going to wait on reading this stuff and just kind of go by my own uh, my own instincts this first time. Because like I said, this is the first time I've read this book. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to check out that cross-reference to Feminine Mystique with this. That sounds good. Okay. Yes, Giovanna? Yeah, well, uh, she, Betty Friedman, who wrote the book, she called it The Problem with No Name. Um, and she was talking about all the middle class American housewives mm -hmm. who were uh, unhappy, kind of similar to the movie Hours with Nicole Kidman. She went oh, yeah, yeah. So they weren't poor, but they were unhappy. Um, that was before the second wave of feminism in the 70s. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the problem with no names. So they were unhappy, but they weren't sure why, because they had everything. They had all the um, cookers and refrigerators and everything and money, mm -hmm. but they weren't happy. Yeah. Generalized anxiety. Yeah. Just the generally free floating anxiety that shouldn't be there considering all the lovely conveniences provided to you by the booming economy and <laughs> so on and so forth. Yeah. It's all, it's all material. <laughs> it's all material. That's right. Yeah. Do you um, know at the same time that, um, sorry, um, Oedipus taking, you know, he's asking her about the tranquilizers. Mm -hmm. I think that that may be about that we may have already have experienced or would experience later Mick Jagger saying about she goes running for the shelter of her mother's little helper doctor please some more of these outside the door she took four more because that was kind of the one of the ways to address this was that they found that um, if you just give them Valium you know yeah. <laughs> If that, you, yeah, you know, yeah. And that's what mother's little helper was. That's I don't kind of, know if that connects, but it'll be fun. That's uh, actually wow, because <laughs> I'm watching the new Adam Curtis documentary series, and there's a whole part about Valium when it came out and how a bunch of people got addicted to it. Uh, and that's the same uh, guy and family in the pharmaceutical world that. Uh, came up with the OxyContin, which was the later, more recent uh, uh, addictive prescription drug that became a blight on, on society. Um, yeah, okay. Hmm. I cannot get it. Why is it so hard for people to accept their own lives? And they yeah. need so many tranquilizers, drugs, so on, escapes and so on. Why cannot they accept their own lives? which are not so bad after all. They're in your hands. You can do with them whatever you like. Well, I mean, it's perhaps complicated uh, by just that angst. She knows that something's missing. Like, she, yeah, not so bad is one thing, but she wants something more. She wants to, to break out. She wants to have some clarity. Um, and maybe she'll pay a price for that. I mean, <laughs> in the story, you know, like... It, depends on how the, the morals are going to fall in, in the story. Yes, Nevena? I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, didn't read the whole chapter. I just uh, passed through this workshop material. And can mm -hmm. you explain us, uh, is it that tower realistic or it is some um, uh, uh, on, the, oh, on the card? What is the, the meaning? What, what is the... Uh, I I put that tower there. Um, that that's a that's a tarot card. It just struck me because that tarot card uh, 
uh, implies the time to make a decision in an urgent situation, a burning tower, you've got to get out, uh, you've got to jump or stay in the tower. Either way is a huge risk, probably better to jump out. And that's the idea. It's like you risk uh, much, but you could also be liberated. Um, I, I put that card there just out of my own association because the tower was certainly used as the metaphor in the story and in the painting that she saw in her memory. Oh, there's another interesting thing that it says about her memory of seeing the painting. She was wearing some kind of goggle glasses um, and she realized she was crying and she wondered if the tears would be locked into the goggles and there was something about the tears from each individual cry that were, that were special. There's something special in each individual cries, tears, and how she might keep them like goggles on so she could see through those tears all the time. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I added that tower there just out of my own uh, volition. I thought it was a parallel that at least struck me. Um, aside from that, it's just that she uh, uses the tower metaphor to describe her, her prison, the, her feeling of being trapped. That's what it is. Would anybody else like to add something or does anybody else have any questions about this? All right. Well, in that case, I hope to see you all next week. Um, like I said, these, it's a short book. The chapters are short, but rich. There's a lot you can get out of even one sentence. You can look in there. There's just all kinds of goodies. Um, it's fun in that respect. Uh, I think some people might perhaps feel a little intimidated when they first get into this, like, wow, this is wild. But remember, uh, there's a lot that you can look at. There, there are plenty of targets, let's say. <laughs> and sometimes it's simpler than it sounds, like the, uh, like Pierce doing all the voices uh, and so on. Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Again, feel free to email me if there's something you would like me to throw into the slideshow. Like if you find some particular passage in the text that you think is interesting or that you're, that you're not sure about, um, feel free to send me and we'll put it into the slideshow. Or if you want to throw in something you've associated, I can put it into the slideshow the same way that I put that tower in there at the end. You can do the same. You know, just let me know and I'll, I'll add your input. Just try not to do it like an hour before the, <laughs> before the session. Okay, in that case, uh, I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening and see you next time. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Liz. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.